is going to come. He is, he is going to tell you what he's done, what he's done in the city of Pittsburgh, which is phenomenal and is in the United States. Before joining Florida and excuse me, before joining the Food and Water Watch team, Doug Shields had a 20-year career in Pittsburgh City Council, 1992 through 2012. During his tenure, Doug was recognized for his expertise in municipal finance, planning and zoning and land use, and as a legislative writer and strategist. He also consistently championed social justice issues. Before entering public service, Doug spent eight years as an environmental litigation paralegal at two prestigious Pittsburgh law firms. He also has been an adjunct instructor at Duquesne University and a guest lecturer at the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. He has served as a board member or trustee for numerous organizations, including the Carnegie Mellon University and the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Doug Shields. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's really good to be here, and I was just terribly impressed with our friend's presentation because I saw so many parallels to what we experience in Pennsylvania and in Pittsburgh as to what's going on in Columbia. And that tells me something that I think we're all on the right track. You start seeing people ending up in the same places, um, whether you're in Pittsburgh or in Columbia. I think uh, that bodes well for all of us that as, a, as a path to where we're going here. Let's start off, and Tom asked me just, you know, I got 10 minutes, I'm not known for my brevity, so I'll try and make this real quick. Let's do a timeline first. In 2003, um, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the USGS uh, reports that we got like a gazillion trillion cubic feet of gas under Pennsylvania. And uh, for a state that had been losing population, the deindustrialization in the 70s and 80s, uh, where my city, where the riverbanks were covered with steel mills and industrial places, they're gone now. They're gone. There's not one steel mill in the city of Pittsburgh. There's mm -hmm. one up the river a little bit on the Mon in Braddock, Edgar Thompson works. They make uh, have a continuous caster there and some things that are going on. But it's really been a revolution of change going on in Pittsburgh. So, and, and the other thing is, is that about 20 miles east of the city in Murraysville, PA, the first commercial natural gas well was drilled, and up north, of course, Titusville, everybody knows the story where the first gas, uh, oil well was. So, you know, we were an extraction state, coal, forestry, uh, oil, gas. There's gas wells all over the place in Pennsylvania, in, in, even in the city of Pittsburgh. There's gas wells in towns that they didn't even know they had in some of the work I've been doing. They're going, holy crap, we didn't know that was there. It's in a business district. And it, it wasn't capped or anything. It was just an old gas well. Uh, so then USGS announces that. And I go, wow, that's good. Jeez, you know, wow, that much gas. We can use it. You know, we'll, we'll have senior citizens that can crank up the thermostat to 90 degrees and do whatever they want. Uh, but the more I started to look at this, and my familiarity with the oil and gas industry was pretty intimate uh, with my paralegal work working for the corporate firms. Uh, and the more I started to see the differences between unconventional drilling and conventional drilling, the more alarmed I became. Then, and so that's 2003. Guess what happens in 2005, folks? Uh, the Energy Act in the United States Congress is passed, and in there is like about 75, 80 words that was worth trillions of dollars. Uh, and that's called the Halliburton loophole that exempts uh, people that are engaged in uh, unconventional drilling, better known as fracking, uh, that they are exempt from all these laws like clean water, clean air, all these other things that regulate just about everybody else in the United States. Steel, Alcoa, Nabisco, Pica. You know, they're all covered under these laws except them. And that's a theme that we see with oil and gas all along. They're exempt from everything. Everybody else has to live within the law. So that was 05. They, you know, that, I went back and looked at that act. It's about 1,200 pages long, and you know, this little provision gets slipped in there. No one knows what the hell it's talking about. Nobody's familiar with fracking. Nobody, they know what's going on, and you end up with that. So they're, they're, they're setting the table. Then comes along in 2006, they drill the first well down in Pennsylvania and, and Washington County. Uh, Range Resources did it, and then uh, from there, 
then, then all of a sudden that's okay we're in 2006 seven eight nine the city's going broke uh or had gone broke we're working through a workout and all of a sudden oil and gas is knocking at the city's door wanting to know you know how much you want for all your parks how much you want for your golf course how much you want for all those hillsides all around pittsburgh they're all part of the city property we call them greenways and they're passive parts uh, but you know they were going to lease those but there would have been a lot of money they were getting you know five six thousand dollar an acre bonus and gosh i couldn't imagine how many millions we would have got for that but the other side of the coin was I started to hear things about this little place called Dimmick up in North Eastern PA. I'm like, what's that all about? Uh, people's wells were contaminated in Dimmick. And then I hear about some problems with dead cows down in Washington County, and I meet a farmer or two. And then in March of 2010, uh, well, I should back up a little bit before that, all of a sudden, oil and gas guys, landmen are knocking on doors in city neighborhoods with a with a contract, a standard lease, which there is no such thing, and a check for $1,200, and they're leasing like 30 foot by 80 foot lots, two, 3,000 foot lots. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. You've got to have hundreds of acres to get that. We don't have forced pulling in Pennsylvania, so you've got to get everybody to create a gas field big enough to go in you know, and get their mineral rights. That made no sense to me either. And I'm like, well, this is getting crazier and crazier. And then I meet this guy, uh, from Dish, Texas, Mayor Calvin Tillman. And Calvin, and I had read an article about him. He was coming to Pittsburgh, and I told my staff, get, get a hold of this guy when I meet him. And well, big long story, Calvin shows me a blood test of his blood from an earlier physical exam, and it's fine. And then he shows me a more recent one, and he's got benzene in his blood. Because in Dish, Texas, they got a huge compressor station. The air quality stinks. It's about 70 miles north of uh, Dallas, and uh, everybody's getting these toxics, uh, 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 BETX, you know, volatile organics, um, and uh, he's got benzene in his blood. And I saw that and I went, holy shit, literally, <laughs> you know, I'm uh, like, wow, I said that a lot during this process. But anyway, so all these things were called the name. And uh, my other council members were concerned too. They were getting people in their neighborhoods wondering why these landmen were knocking on their door. And they said, uh, gee, you know, Doug, you're, you're the zoning guy. This is a land use matter. You better, you know, go write some laws up and get rid of these guys. Make them go away. And while we're doing this in 2010, we had three wells blow up within 70 miles of Pittsburgh. Don Monzel, West Virginia, we had a blowout. Up in Clearfield, uh, up here we're that speaker's gonna be season very. Um, up in Clearfield, they had a blowout and they had to evacuate two square uh, two miles. Now, you, in Clearfield, you could do that with two school buses, right? If I evacuate a, a square mile or a mile uh, around a, a site in the city, where am I putting all those people? Yeah. We're all going to Clearfield, I guess, living in tents. <laughs> and, and, you know, subsequently, these things have happened. And I've seen communities where people have been out of their homes for up to 10, 11, 12 days till they got things straightened out at the site. And so, it became clear this pose this activity is posing a clear and present danger to the city it is part of our oath of office to protect the health welfare and safety that's prime of the residents of whom we represent and that goes from the dog catcher all the way up to the president of the united states or in Pennsylvania's case the governor we're all bound by these obligations uh, and and so what happened was <clears throat> The more I worked on the zoning solution, the more I realized is that this isn't going to work. We're going to get fracked. There is no zoning solution. And so what I, I did was I ended up running into cell death. And uh, they called, called another council member and sent them a community rights ordinance, uh, model ordinance and so forth. And I look at that and I go, oh, the light goes on. Because how many of you know anything about zoning? That's a lot more than I usually run in. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little specialized here. But, but, imagine all of you that know something about zoning going out and talking about it to your neighbors. <laughs> right? Yeah. Just to explain the premise before you get to the problem. Forget about it. You're the nerd. You're the, you know, what the hell is he talking about? Using words nobody ever heard of before. 
So when I read the community rights ordinance for Mr. Lindsay, the wildest, the wildest radical in America, <laughs> the light bulb goes off. And I go, great, instead of trying to make this argument in a zoning context, I'm going to stand over here and I'm going to do something, I'm going to put this crazy ordinance in the conduct section of our code, which is more about utilization of police powers. Because I'm going to couch, couch this argument in rights. Everybody gets rights. I got a right, right? We say it all the time. I got a right to own a gun. I got a right to piss in my backyard at night. I feel like it. Uh, I got a right to do everything. Anything I want. I shouldn't have said that. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway. But, you know, so putting it into a context of rights is incredibly important. It was a revelation to me. A revelation. What do you mean we're going to do this? And then when I read it, I like, you know, my objective was let's get rid of this fracking crap. And so it's banned in there. But then there's more. And then you find out about the rights of nature. And if you want to go online, just look up the city of Pittsburgh, community rights ordinance, and you'll see the code language itself. Take it to your local official, ask them to do the same thing. Don't worry about Congress. You're going to know where their most high state houses stink. As far as any, you know, they're usually bought and paid for by the corporate types. Uh, your best shot right now is at the local government level. That's where the action's at. That's where you have opportunity. In Allegheny County, I have 130 municipalities. It's the third most municipally driven uh, county in the country. And I go around these days and straighten their, their ordinances out and do zoning with them and all kinds of crazy stuff. But I, I go, I got 130 governments, I like my chances. If I'm working with one, if they don't like me, I'm done. But by working locally, at your local government level, that does filter up, believe you me. That local, maybe they're not going to, your congressman or your state rep is going to pay attention to you as an individual. But local elected officials have a special place in the political food chain, and without their support, those folks above them aren't going to last you long in office. So that makes a big, big impression on them. So that's what you, you really got to think about that. Then, um, we had, we had no ability to regulate the activity. That's a, we're preempted, one of Tom's favorite topics. We can't, you know, and not, I don't want to regulate them. I, it costs a lot of money. You gotta, I gotta hire a bunch of people. I gotta have a bunch of enforcement to go along with that. I don't want to regulate the operations of oil and gas drilling in Pittsburgh. It's crazy. But uh, the funny thing was in Pennsylvania, when they started building that first wall in 2006, they had zero regulatory format. None. Zero. We made it up as we went along. People suffered. Wells are in bad shape. Stay tuned, folks. At the end of the month, we're expecting a grand jury to come out with some uh, significant report or indictments or presentments of some sort from the AG's office on the activities of this industry in the last 10 years or so. Stay tuned. It's going to be big. Uh, the other thing is, we, um, Tom asked me about the regulatory thing. He said, why would we want to do that? And on the, you know, in fact, Pennsylvania stumbles into this thing. In 2013, they finally update the Oil and Gas Act to begin, and, and also there's newer, you know, better regulations and all this other crap. Meanwhile, every time they turn around, they go, oh, we got the toughest regulations uh, in the country. And I've heard that in every state of the union, uh, and they are not, and they lie. And, uh, you know, they tell you things is the bridge field of the future, and you go, okay, how long's the bridge, and what's on the other side, and they go, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the game changer, oh, what's the game? What's the rules? I didn't know we had a game. What's going on here? Tell me about it. And a lot of the people that support this can't tell you anything other than it's jobs and money. And that seems not to be true, too, especially with gas now trading at $1.86 uh, thousand cubic feet of gas. You can't frack and make money under two and a quarter. Two fifty. You might be breaking even. They're in trouble. And you got a very robust economy, and some idiot tells you about what well, the economic benefit of it is. You've got the hottest economy this country's seen in decades, and guess who's failing in this sector? The energy sector is failing, failing, failing. Think about that. So what are our rights? And what we did was in Pittsburgh is that I was able to convince most of my council members to, to join in on this bill. Probably most of them didn't even read it. Uh, it's like, okay, we're going to ban it, you got my vote. That happens a lot. And I'm more than happy to take it that way. Yeah. Give me the vote. 
A couple didn't. We had a rough about a little bit. He's like, well, I could have gotten, uh, we did. Um, I could have gotten a, a majority vote. Five would be fine, six is nice, seven. But I wanted it unanimous. We had to stand together in solidarity. And, and we did. And when it passed, I knew it was important. I didn't realize how important it would be or what it was. This was the first time this was ever done in the United States, if not the world, where you banned hydraulic fracturing. And of course, after about a day or two of phone calls from press and everybody else, I was like, maybe I should get someone to start my car for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is off a lot of people. And we're not talking, you know, we're talking not billions of dollars, we're talking about trillions of dollars in this matter. So people do a lot of crazy stuff for trillions of dollars. Uh, hopefully they weren't going to do it to me. But what happened was, so we passed that ordinance, it's on the books today, and um, it wasn't until after it passed, Ian Rabina had done, uh, a reporter at the New York Times had done a great series uh, called Drilling Down, where he exposed the Ponzi scheme and all that stuff, and they had to throw him off the story because the New York Times got so much pressure on that uh, matter about Ian. But, he came to Pittsburgh three days after the, the bill was passed and made an ordinance, and he brought a researcher with him, and I happened to be at this conference, and we were talking, the researcher goes, but Doug, you have a, you have a succession clause in that ordinance. And I said, you're the first one that mentioned it. Because everybody just said, oh, they're banning, they're banning, they're banning. What they did, a lot of people didn't focus on was the rights of nature that's in the code, that our ability to tell the federal and state government, no, so thank you. You are not going to impose a poison on us, as was just demonstrated here. You don't have the right to come in and have us dance at the end of a string of a corporate interest where money is the primary concern, whereas over here I took an oath that safety is the primary concern. And the health and the welfare, not only of the people, and why would you not want to convey rights to ecosystems? What you do when you get up in the morning. What is sustaining you to breathe and to live on this planet is the ecosystem that you live in. And a lot of people see humanity over here and nature over here. And foolishly so because they don't understand how this is all one thing and we are a part of it. And we can't be the part that goes out and infects the whole system and brings it crashing down to our own end, which is what we're doing right now. The 20th century was an incredibly difficult period. Uh, more injury this planet suffered than any. I mean, two crazy world wars with millions of people dead and pollutant and everything else. So what you gotta look for when you go back home, go back to your local ordinance and look at your zoning code and see if you're protected from these activities <laughs> that impose dangers to the community and the ecosystem that sustains it. Go look at your ordinances. Do you have one? Get one. If you don't have one, talk to your legislator about it, your local, your local guy, the one you see in the grocery store every day. You don't see your congressman in the grocery store. Believe me, when you go to shop and you're an elected official, it's, it, you know, get the gallon of milk's an hour and a half process. <laughs> you know, like, oh, there you go. You got gravity, you got your finger in your chest. And you're like, oh, thank you for your thoughtful comment. <laughs> <laughs> It's a wonderful life thing. But, but um, I have the ordinance here, and I got to close. I got like less than a minute. And it says the the thought, it says here the foundation for the making and adoption of this law is the people's fundamental and inalienable right to govern themselves. Remember that from the revolution? Of course, they were revolutionaries, mostly socialists and whatnot. Um, any attempts to use other units and levels of government to preempt amend, alter, or overturn this chapter, or parts of this chapter shall require the council to hold public meetings and explore the adoption of other measures to expand local control and, and, as a, to protect their fundamental and inalienable right to self-government. And such consideration shall be made um, through public hearings and so forth. Uh, we, have, we assert our rights. We, my basic line was, I have a right to say no thank you. I, I, on any kind of level, whether it's health, welfare, and safety, financially, what it would cost the city to equip its firefighters, and believe me, go to the firefighter union, oh boy, they'll take care of the coals every time. And now I'm gonna have to have special master firefighter for well fires, 
I'm going to have to buy all this equipment, and even if I never use it, I'm going to have to have the taxpayers pay for it, not the oil and gas company that's causing me to pay for it. And by the way, they get tax credit for every gallon they pull out of the ground or something like that, usually the state legislators. So you have to assert your rights. Your best place to assert them, in my humble opinion, is at your local government level and start causing a rocket because it does affect the neighboring <laughs> municipalities around you. And that's it, and I'll finish with this. In next, the following year, 2010, Wilkinsburg, Forest Hills, East Pittsburgh, and Baldwin Borough all enacted the same ordinance. And then later, uh, State College PA took this ordinance and amended it to their home rule charter and it passed by 72%. Now, they would say, you can't do that, that's illegal. But my proposition to the governor was this, then drive into State College, stand on top of the roof of your limousine and tell everybody at State College, your votes don't count. <laughs> and that's the politics involved in this. They can pass laws that say this, and this is the political irony, you're right, but you're wrong. And in this case, my governor was right, but he was wrong. And I was wrong, but I was right. <laughs>